Lord, what a gift it is to be here. And Father, we do, we do need you. And Lord, we thank you for being in this place and for drawing us closer to you today. Lord, we lift up uh, the service and pray for the, the teaching, Father, that you would uh, speak clearly to your people. That they hear your voice today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, I'm, I'm not a big movie buff, uh, but there is a, a scene in a movie that I, that I really like that, that kind of is applicable in, in numerous circumstances in life. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Indiana Jones saga, but in Indiana Jones and the, in the uh, Last Crusade, there's a scene where Elsa, who's the woman who's kind of played both sides of the fence, and, and she's taking the, the cup and the rule is you can't, the cup can't pass the seal. And if it does, bad things are going to happen. But the, the cup is supposed to be the cup of Christ. I, the, the, it's supposed to also, if you drink from it, you keep eternal life. But the, the rule is you can't pass the seal. And so as she uh, sees the, the, it's the tail end of the movie, she sees the cup. It's laying there. She picks it up and she starts to cross the seal. And there's a great earthquake and the, the cup falls and she falls. And she's hanging on. Indiana Jones is hanging on to her. And she can almost reach the cup. And she's reaching for it, and he's telling her, let go, let it go, grab back onto me because I'm going to drop you. And she doesn't, and she continues to reach for the cup, and she falls, and she goes into a cloud of smoke, and we don't know what happens to her. I'm pretty sure she died. That's the whole point of it. But immediately, the earth shakes, and Indiana Jones falls over, and his dad grabs him, and he can almost reach the cup. And he's reaching for it, and he's telling his dad, I've almost got it, and his dad says, Indiana, let it go. And he does, and then they, they all get out of there, and everything's great. But what's fascinating with that to me is there are a lot of times in life where we're reaching for things that, that perhaps we ought to let go. And there are choices that we have to make. One of those choices, if you're here with us today, is really what are you going to do with eternity? What are you going to do with, with God? And the nation of Israel, if you've been with us through our, our walk through 1 Samuel, uh, what we've seen is in the last couple weeks we've dealt with the Philistines being in over their heads, the ark comes back, and that now the nation of Israel is in a position where they have to make a choice. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 7. And we're going to jump in at verse 3, and like we typically do, I'm going to uh, read a portion, we'll talk about what's going on, and then we'll continue going through. We're going to finish all of chapter 7 today, uh, beginning in verse 3. So 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. And Samuel said to all of the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the ashtoreth among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people put away the Baals and the ashtoreth, and they served the Lord only. We'll stop there for a moment. Interesting uh, that the, the nation of Israel has this situation where they, again, have to make a choice. If you've read through the book of Judges, you know this is constantly uh, coming up where they, they walk away from God. Then they have to choose to uh, repent and come back. And then, then they walk away again. And this, and this. But this is, again, happening here. And any time I read of this, I always, in, in my own mind, think of, of the time when Elijah stands before the nation of Israel in 1 Kings. And it's a fascinating story. He stands before all of them. And, he, and here in 1 Kings 18, it reads that, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different option, opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then it goes on. The people didn't answer him. They were going to wait and see what happens. But oftentimes we're, there's this position that we look at where a nation has to choose. Are we going to follow God or not? The United States has to choose this. Now, let me preface this. We are not Israel. We're the United States of America. Israel is Israel. They're the child, God's chosen people. We don't replace them. But we're in a position as a nation, I think we do have to choose. But dare I say, the choice may have been made already. Back in 2012, the Democratic National Convention. Interestingly, you may not understand this now, let me preface all of this by saying I'm neither Democrat nor, nor Republican. I don't even know that I would be considered politically independent. I'm a Christ follower, and everything I dictate in the poll booth when I fill out those cards, I look at as I'm accountable to God for what I put down there. So whoever I elect, whoever I vote for, it doesn't matter if they win or not, I'm accountable to God. And I want you to think of that because we have an election coming up. You're accountable to God for whose name you put down. Not accountable to me. You're accountable to him. And there are disqualifying factors that I think many on, on either side of the, the polling that have. But with that said, 
Democratic National Convention. You may not understand know that the Rasmussen uh, did a poll back in 2012. About 33% of the U.S. population would identify themselves as Democrat. 33%, uh, again, right around 30 to 33, would say Republican, and then the rest are kind of in the middle there of independent. 33% of the U.S. population identifies themselves as Democrat. The Democrats came out with their platform in 2012, and who did they forget in their platform? God. God. They forgot God. And Obama, the president, said, this is a problem. And, and they could see the political writing of this is a major issue. And so what do they do? They attempt to cram God back in. But what's interesting is you have to vote God back in. And you may not have known this. I, and if you haven't seen it, watch it on YouTube. You can go back and, and check and see if they actually vote him back in because they don't. They go by the, the, how the audience responds. And I think it has to be two-thirds of, the, of the, the group has to acknowledge that they want to put the, make this change. And if you listen to it, they don't get two-thirds. The, the, two, the, the louder group is the group that says, no, we don't want God in our platform. This is 33% of the population represented saying, no, we don't want God. It's fascinating. I, I look at that and I think, well, that's amazing. Now, I don't care if you, you may be a Democrat and, and say, no, they don't represent me. Yes, they do. In our culture, they do. It's exactly who represents you. That's why I would say I'm not any of those people because none of them represent me. I'm not going to align with any of them. But, but really, we look at this in terms of what, what does that mean for us? How, you know, they 30, a third of the nation has stated we don't want God. That's crazy. Just think, I, I look at it and think, we're in trouble as a, as a nation. And, 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 and really, when we bear this out, we look at it in terms of, if you remember, uh, Pastor Daniel was here a couple years ago. And, and one of the things he stated is, as a country, a nation gets the leaders it deserves. <laughs> And how many of us complain about Congress? How many of us complain about the president? How many of us complain about the Senate? How many of us, we complain about all these civic leaders, yet we get the, the, the leaders that we deserve. I find it fascinating because we, we and, and in the church, we are notorious for complaining. And, and I'm chief amongst the complainers. But really, we have to look at it and say, this is a heart issue with the country. This is a heart issue with the culture. This is a heart issue with the people. Which I think is also the other part where it bears out in this a person in and of themselves. A greater concern for me is not necessarily the status of the United States and the world affairs. I think it's important and I love being, uh, I love being a part of this country. I love being uh, considered an American citizen. I love everything about this nation. However, I love God more. And, and ultimately we have to look at this in terms of every individual has to choose. And I, as, I, as I read this, when we consider what the nation of Israel is, is placed with, with verse Samuel, what Samuel is saying this, as I look at this, this is a personal choice that everybody has to make. What are you going to do with God? What are you going to do with Him? You see, oftentimes in, in our, our culture, we have this proclivity for needing a benefit out of a relationship. And, and I refer to it as an entitled mentality. What am I going to get out of this? And we have this proclivity to, to look at God and, and wonder, you know, what is it that, what do I get out of the deal if I'm going to enter into this? And, and there are numerous things I could go with. I could try to sell you on the argument for eternal life. Get right with God and you get eternity. You get eternal life. That's fascinating too, by the way. Get your sin covered, you get eternity. That's, that's a great selling point. Isn't that a fantastic selling point? If we look at this, if you commit your life to Christ and you, then, and you believe and accept the gift, you get eternal life. That's a big deal. But I don't even know that we need to sell it like that. You see, I, I also think that, that we could use the argument of, well, you, you can receive God's love, mercy, and grace. This is who God is. Don't you want to be in a relationship with this God? Isn't that fantastic? We, we look at that and I think that's a fantastic selling point too. But then I also go with the, with the notion of, I, I think you get these cool spiritual gifts. Yeah, you receive it and the Holy Spirit comes in. He brings a gift and he has it and you're supposed to share it with everybody else. But we don't want to focus on that. You get a cool gift. And so maybe your gift is to play guitar. You could be up in the worship band. Ba -da -da -ba -da -ba, play the guitar. Or you could sing. Whatever it is, you get, come to Christ and you get these cool spiritual gifts. Yeah, it would be one of our cool selling points. But I don't think we need that. You know, the overcoming of death, death can't touch you, that's a pretty cool thing to say. I don't even have to be afraid of death. But I think really, might we not get right with God simply for the fact that he's God? Amen. Really, are we not just get right with God because of the notion and recognition of who he is? He's God for goodness sakes. I guess we could say for his sake. He's God for his sake. He's God. Ought that not be enough of a motivation for us to say, well, I probably ought to consider this. 
But I hear an argument, and it continues to battle around, and I look at it, this is the most illogical argument I've ever heard. And I've heard people say, I don't, want to, I don't want to worship a God or submit to a God that would send people to hell. There are, there are big problems with, with that statement. And, and really, we look at this in terms of what are the major, there are major logical errors in it. First off, I would look and say, well, this doesn't make sense. If God, because God doesn't send people to hell, but we'll just kind of go from this cat. If God sent people to hell, this is a very powerful God. I do not want to get in right relationship with him if he has that much power. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to go another route and say, well, I don't want to go. So much of that's like, it's, that's stupid. And really, that argument is just dumb. I look at it, and that's when I would shake people. So, do you hear what you're even saying? But we have to look at that and say, well, that's not necessarily even true. God doesn't send people to hell. God pours out his grace and mercy. People choose to go end up going to hell. So, if, if we more accurately uh, look at this, what I would think what we'd be dealing with is really a people's lack of understanding of the holiness of God and really a basic lack of legal precedence and understanding. For instance, I'm going to tell you a story that I shouldn't tell you. Because it makes me look like an idiot. So we'll say it's Bill. <laughs> Bill is driving my kids to football practice. And the speed limit changed. And Bill didn't know it. And as he's driving in my minivan, the speed limit goes from 45 apparently to 35. Unbeknownst to Bill. Well, Bill really kind of knew it, but he didn't pay attention. So a state patrol officer, which if you know, if there's a state patrol officer and they pull you over, you're getting a ticket. There's zero grace for them. And so the state patrol officer points at Bill and points. And then you see in your rearview mirror, he points to the car behind Bill and gets two people at once. This is a busy day for this officer. Comes up to the door. And if you've ever been pulled over by uh, an officer, I, I have a tremendous amount of, of respect and grace for, for police officers because they have no idea who I am. Comes up and he's gruff. Do you know how fast you were going? Said, no. Do you know what the speed limit is? 40? No, it's, four, it's 35 and you're going 46. Okay. Give me your license and register. Pretty gruff. And what are you doing? I'm going and I'm taking my kids to football practice. Bill's taking my kids to football practice. <laughs> Okay, very respectful. It goes up, officer goes up to the next car, gets his, and, and he comes back and he's shaking his head. You know something bad will happen in that interaction when a police officer is shaking their head as they're walking away from your car. So I thought, oh no, he's going to be upset. Comes back to the door, asks Bill, what time do you need to be there? He says, 5.30. He says, I'll get you done real quick, then I'm going to deal with this guy. Now, ooh, great opportunity for Bill to speak to my son about the, the need to be respectful to police officers. Because apparently this other fellow wasn't. You get the ticket, on oh, the ticket he says, now listen, I, got you only, I only put you at 10 over, you were going 11 over, I put you at 10 over. Now, if you've never gotten a ticket, you may not know that there are three boxes you can check. One is, you can argue you didn't do it. And I look at Bill, looks at that, and says, well, that's not true. I know I was speeding. I had no idea what the speed, I knew I was going over it, but I didn't know what else. The second box is, you can check it, you say, yes, I did this, but there are mitigating circumstances. Very tempting. <laughs> But if you check that, you have to go into court and then argue. Now, with a good chance, you go into court, they're going to knock the thing down. The third box is you check it, and it says, yes, I did this. I'm going to pay the fine. Well, we'll leave Bill alone. I looked at it. Man, I could argue this in court. And I started thinking, what are the mitigating circumstances? And in my mind, I'm making up mitigating circumstances. I realize this is not okay. So I check it. I send the check in. And now, now let's look at this from a basic legal understanding. 20 minutes before, I wasn't speeding. Most of the time, my wife doesn't speed. Half the time, I do. Most of the but there's a lot of times I'm not speeding. In this instance, I was guilty. Absolutely guilty. It's the exact same thing with sin. All you got to do is sin once and you're guilty of sin. That's it, and there's a consequence for it. You have to pay the fine. Either you pay the fine or God pays the fine, but somebody's paying a fine here. You sin one time. And you've tarnished your, your relationship with God. That's what we call on God's grace. And this is the basic understanding of, of, of logic and of the, the legal statutes that we have to grasp when we deal with a holy God. Is you are guilty before God. Regardless of the mitigating circumstances. You have been, at some point in your life made a choice. To, now this is why we look at this as a Christian and say God doesn't send anybody to hell. The reality of it is he says here. Here's your fire insurance. Do you want it? And many of us will say yes please. 
And we take the fire and juice, we enter into a relationship with the Holy God, and it's fantastic. But then there are others, I don't want that. I don't want to go to this worship this guy who just sent people to hell, even though I'm guilty. That's foolishness. You see, it all comes back to this personal choice. What are you going to do with this gift that God has? What are you going to do? Because you're guilty. And if you're sitting here today and you've not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, understand you're guilty before a holy God. Not me. I was guilty. I'm guilty too. I, I look at this. That's why I fall on my knees at Christ and say, "Praise your God for your grace and mercy," which I fully got to kind of grasp. You, you really, I don't fully understand how God is so gracious and so merciful. It's crazy to me because I see some of the stuff that people do, and I think I would have zero grace. But God pours this grace out for us. And as we as we press on, we, we look at this in terms of of really recognizing uh, the notion of why not choose God just for the, simply for the fact that He's God. And then when we look at his grace and mercy, we see uh, things stated, especially with nations, stated like in Isaiah. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And again in Joel, the prophet says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Your God, uh, and rid your hearts, from, excuse me, to, to, uh, not your garments, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over desert. What would happen if our nation turned back to God? He'd show us mercy. He'd pour out his grace. It'd be easy. It's, it's, it's a matter of, are we going to? I read the end of the book. We're not mentioned. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But it's fascinating to me to look at this and think God's mercy is so abundant that even a nation, he would look at this and say, you're going to follow me, you're going to be my people, you're going to follow after me, pour out my grace and mercy on you. But if not, you're going to deal with the consequences of it. And Israel, if you want to look through their history, it's to deal with the wrath of God and pour out his grace. And interesting thing is we look, we know who God is. We abund it's abundantly clear how good God is a holy God. We have to press even further and we look at this. Well, what does Christ say for those of us in, in personal this? What does Christ say about God? Christ says, serve God alone. We'll see that in a moment. But in, in our culture, there was a, a kind of a catchphrase, and, and I think it's still uh, running pretty rampant. The interesting thing with catchphrases in Christianity is they, there's almost like a shelf life. It lasts for a few months, and then at that point, they get perverted into something different. And, and the catchphrase was, was, what would Jesus do? And people will throw out, what would Jesus do? And it's usually in some kind of a, an element of, quit bugging me because I don't want you to call me out of my sin. What would Jesus do? And that's, it's this, oh, you throw this out of judgment, and hey, don't, you wouldn't be judgmental. And I, I look at that and think, well, you don't know Jesus. Is he judgmental? No, he's not judgmental, but he's going to point out your sin. Do you forget him throwing the tables over? Making a quart of whips. whips. That's fascinating to me. Here's our Savior chasing people around with a whip. That's, that's awesome, because he's got zeal for the house of God. What would Jesus do? He'd call you out on your sin. We see this also in, in John 4 with the woman at the well. It's a great interaction. He shouldn't even be talking to her in the first place. But it's this great interaction. He's talking to her about uh, the, 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 if she drinks the water, him, and it'll well up in her into eternal life. And, and she's, oh, give me this water. He says, well, go get your husband. This is it. This is fascinating. So, oh, well, uh, I don't have a husband. That's right. You've had five. And the guy you're with now isn't your husband. Calls her out on her sin right there. Why? Because we have to deal with it. What about the woman, the one that everybody loves to think, the, the mention is, who cast the first stone? And they, they, they're going to stone this adulterous woman, and they, they got their stones, and they're ready, and he bends down, and he writes something in the sand. This is John chapter 8. Writes something in the sand, and he stands up, and they're gone. And he looks at her and says, is there anybody left to condemn you? No, there's nobody left to I don't condemn you either. And then we always forget the last sentence. Go and sin no more. Jesus is big on dealing with your sin. But I think the most interesting one that I see in, in what would Jesus do in dealing with sin is with our, our hero, Peter. Who, in a moment prior to this, when Jesus says, who people say, is, he says, hey, you're the Christ. He says, yes, Peter. I mean, he changes his name to Little Rock, and on this big rock, I mean, in, the, in the confession that I'm the Christ, I'm going to build my church. This is, this is Peter. He's our guy. It's the one that in Acts we see standing before the same men that, that get, took Jesus out to be crucified, standing before them proclaiming who he is. This is Peter, our guy. And, he, and Jesus looks at him in a moment after he's saying, hey, I'm going to be taken away and they're going to kill me. And, and he looks at him and he rebukes Christ. And Christ turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. You read exactly what he said. Then Jesus said, be God, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall serve and, and only him shall you serve. 
Interesting. It's a big deal to Jesus that we serve God, that we serve a holy God. That's a big deal. It's a big deal for Christ that we deal with sin and we deal with it appropriately and we deal with it effect that, that we acknowledge, yes, I'm <coughs> sinful and there is only one way into heaven and only one way into truth and only one way into life. There's only one way to get to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ. That's, that's, a, that's a big deal to him. In fact, it's so big that he ended up on the cross for it and overcoming death for us. That's a big deal. So when we look at this in terms of, of what does Christ teach us, he teaches us and tells us to serve God alone. Interesting, because here's the nation of Israel with this choice. Are you going to serve God or not? Because the reality of it is that sin is sin. But God is gracious and will forgive that sin. It's, that doesn't absolve the notion that sin is sin. It doesn't matter how we want to sell it, if we want to wrap it and put this nice cellophane. We have those bags at Christmas time. You put your stuff in, you get the tissue paper. It looks all fantastic. You even spray a little perfume. If you're a woman, it's, shh, shh, shh. it's so, so lovely. You take it to your friend. Oh, it's so wonderful. And you open it up and it's a big pile of sin. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we wrap it in. It doesn't matter what we want to say. A sin is sin. When we acknowledge it and we fall on our face and, and repent before God and agree to serve Him and look to Him uh, for our repentance or for our cleansing and our righteousness, then we can fall on His mercy. But as we press forward, the nation of Israel chooses, they say, yes, they're going to put away their bales and their ashtray, they're going to choose to follow after God, and it's fascinating what happens next. Pick it up in verse 5. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now, when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord for our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound on that day against the Philistines and threw them into a confusion. And they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as, uh, as, far as below beth -car. Interesting. It's fascinating because the first thing that we're going to fall on our knees, resist God, and hey, we want to follow after you. We want, to, we want you to uh, be our God and we want to follow after you. Tim, can you activate my slide there? I think it's, it's gotten lost. Maybe not. But they're going to fall after you. And what's the first thing we see? First thing that happens is they submit to God and there's an attack. Immediately. There's a, they're, they're, now we've lost the whole thing. <laughs> There we go. There we go. They, now, oftentimes we come to Christ, and this is what I. This is the difficulty with really selling uh, what we sell here. We want to sell everything's going to be fantastic, it's going to be rainbows and lollipops, everything's going to be great. No, as soon as you commit your life to Christ, guess what happens? You get a big giant test. Yeah. Even for us that have walked with the Lord for a while, is is we we get, is, step away for a second, and come back. Oh, I got to refocus my life on Christ. Guess when the biggest time to get hit in a pastor's family is Saturday night before Sunday morning. And it's not Sunday morning anymore for me because I leave before the trouble can start. And I can get here. How many of you had difficulty getting to church today? Hard time getting up, getting the kids out of bed. All of a sudden, Wheaties are flying across the room. You have milk spilling all down the front of you. Oh, man drinking coffee and it spills. You get in a fight with your wife or your spouse or you, you get on the drive-in because she doesn't know what she's talking about and she just won't listen to you. I feel you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Send your letters, attention, no will <laughs> Problems with pastors. <laughs> but really, we look at this and, and, and really, we have to look at that in terms of as soon as we step out of faith. And why is this? Because the reality of it is we live in a fallen world and we're following after a holy God. The world wants to squelch that. Sin wants to squelch that. 
And that's what happens here to the nation of Israel. They step up and say, we're going to follow after God. We're going to put everything away. We're going to follow God. And what happens? The Philistines gather to attack. And if you remember, if you've been with us, you know that the Philistines just beat the tar out of Israel a few chapters earlier. And when I say beat them, they gave them a whooping. It wasn't even close. They just decimated them. Unlike what's happened with Al-Qaeda. <laughs> that'll make sense tomorrow when you read the news. But, but really, they've decimated the nation. This is really what's happened is, is this, they just mashed them up. And, and so then they take the ark, and if you remember, they take the ark, and they got the ark, and then they, the ark starts killing Philistines. Wax over Dagon, his head falls off, and he's trying to crawl out of the room. Dagon, by the way, is their idol. And, and, and people start getting tumors. There's so much so that these knuckleheads go to their priests, and the priests say, hey, make these golden tumors, which I still don't get, and golden rats, and give it back as a guilt offering to God. And they get rid of this. Right? They send it. Get it out of here. Now, there is a lack of logic with these people, because the reality of this is we just escaped because it was just God. It was just the ark we're dealing with. Now, we're going to go after God's people. It's a big problem. They're banking that God has abandoned them. That's the bank that they're making. There's a lack of logic here. In one sense, we look at it and say, oh, we, can't. we better not go up against God. God is wiping us out. And in the next sense, they're going to go after God's people, hoping that God is a man. Interesting. But what they don't know is that the people have gotten right with God. And I find that, that amazing. You see, there's, there's an issue in our culture. I look at this as the, the Philistines have some logical problems. There's an issue in our culture where I believe the world lacks logic. I think in a fallen world, you look at it and if you attempt to make it a logical argument, oftentimes it falls on deaf ears. We see in, in, uh, that, that Isaiah states, the prophet in, in, read the opening chapter of Isaiah, come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like uh, red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And the opening part of that I think is fascinating. Come let us reason. Why does God ask for us to reason? Because God is a logical God. The structure of the universe is logical. It makes sense. Yeah. Rabbi Zacharias, if you, if you know who he is, uh, had, a, had a gentleman as he was teaching at a school or as he, he was presenting at a school come up to him and say something about a lifestyle that this gentleman was living in. And he said, well, what's really wrong with that? And, and Rabbi Zacharias took him back a couple steps and said, wait a minute. How do we determine what's right and wrong? How do you know what's right and wrong? You see, the fact that we have moral absolutes dictates that we have an understanding that there is a moral law giver. Law, basic logic in and of itself testifies to a holy God. I, I tend to harp on psychology, and if you don't uh, know my history, I have a master's in clinical psych, um, and so I tend to harp on it. But there are uh, bright, there are lights within that world, and, and there was a, a psychologist who wrote a, an article in Psychology Today back in 2011. And in it, the, the article itself is called The Scientific Atheism Fallacy. How science declares that God is dead but can't prove it. And he goes on, and I'll just read a portion of this article. Uh, the gentleman's name is, is Nicholas Cardar Cardaris. Uh, he's a PhD. And, and he goes on, he states in this article, because really if any scientists proudly and self-assuredly declare themselves atheists, Richard, Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawkins, you know who you are, then they are not only being intellectually dishonest, but they are also going counter the guiding principles that the thing that they profess to love so much. Science. In science, we can't affirmably know or assert something until we've empirically proven it. Uh, absent of such affirmative data, the true and proper scientific stance should at least uh, should be one that echoes Socrates' credo of I know that I do not know. And he goes on and states, thus without any affirmative scientific proof that God does not exist, the default position should be one of an agnosticism of I don't know since I don't have enough data one way or the other. And that's fascinating because then he goes on and he says, but that's not even true. There is enough data to prove the existence of God. He, he cites from Thomas Aquinas, he says, here's the one thing, there is logically consistent proof for the existence of God. It's not commonly taught in those public schools, but Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century philosopher and theologian, developed five proofs. And he goes on just to, to speak of two of the proofs. Aquinas argues that something, i.e. us, the universe, can't arise from nothing. That something, namely God, had to be the cause of all things and of all movement. And he goes on further and says, uh, Aquinas' second key has to do with the universe's tendency towards order, which seems to contradict the chaos of the laws of entropy, and, and uh, in order comes out of disorder, leads to the conclusion that the universe has some sort of purposeful, unfolding basic logic. Let's reason together. Basic logic testifies to the evidence of God. It's fascinating. 
and how, how often we will look at that and, and deny. How often people will look at that and deny. And then you get into the ad hominem attacks where you argue, as well, and they, they want to come after you as an individual, and you know at that point, oh, this is almost useless. They're going to hear. But I, I look at that in terms of the, the world itself. And why would that be? Why would the Philistines go after the, the, the nation of Israel? Why would people come after the, the truth of who God is? Why is it that they would argue that? I think the primary, first and foremost reason that we see it today in our culture, that we see it in the Western culture, is the reality of I want to be God. It permeates people's lives. I want to be the one. I want to be the one and the only. I want this to be about me. And as soon as I acknowledge that God exists, as soon as I recognize that God is a loving God, as soon as I acknowledge all of that, I'm no longer the one. He is. Fascinating to look at this. And, and really for us to, to be able to, to kind of like, so this lack of logic, it, it is abundant. And we see that here in the, in the nation of, with the Philistines coming after the nation of Israel. We see that every day in our own lives as we look at this and, and there are those hard nosed that people that say, ah, you go to the, the Institute of Higher Education, you'll see there's rampant throughout there. There's a complete lack of logic in it. And we look at that and I scratch my head and say, how can such smart people be so stupid? That's just the way it is. But why does this happen almost immediately when we say, God, I'm going to live for you. This is what we call faith tests. There are tests of our faith that happen and occur uh, throughout our lives and throughout our time together. And, and as, we, as we commit ourselves to God, what, what an interesting test. When you get up on Sunday morning and you determine, I'm going to go to church today. And you look over and your kid throws the weeds at you. <laughs> and God says, really? You're going to come see me today? Come on. Are you able to make it through this? Do you love me enough? Are you willing to do that? Or the faith test of the easy, the low, the low hanging fruit for us is really to look at, at, at anybody that's struggled with any kind of addiction. As soon as you say, I'm going to live for Christ, guess what? Phone starts ringing from people you never heard of or have heard from in a long time. Hey, you want to go out? Oh, man. I don't know. Should I go out? And, and so we run into these tests. These are these basic tests. And so God's, really, we look at that in terms of, God. I, I look at it as if we believe that God is, a so, is sovereign, then we have to look and say, God is in control of all that. Why would God allow us to be tested? What happens when you pass a test? You're better for it. Develop perseverance. I'm in a situation now where I, I just acknowledge to my wife, I said, oh, I'm scared of, of doing this because I, I can't solve the problem. And if you don't know, I'm quitting my uh, third job of, as, as a therapist, which is actually, to be honest, that pays very well. And so it's one of those, I'm, I'm looking at my wife and I'm saying, well, I, I'm scared because I don't know. And my wife looks at me and says, basically, this is how I interpret when my wife talks to me. Are you stupid? We've been in a worse spot than this before. And she reminds me of this. I says, well, woman, be quiet. She's right, and the, the reality of it is, is we look at that in terms of we develop perseverance. And we have to, and, and that's really when we pass, when we pass the test, really, if you, don't, if you don't pass the test, it's a retake, because you're going to be there again. Yeah. Sunday comes back around. Yeah. You're going to be there again. You have to take the test again. So when you pass it, you start to develop strength, and, and you start to move forward on these things. And I look at that in terms of you grow in, in grace, you grow in your love for God and your relationship with God. And I think it's interesting, because Israel takes a completely different battle strategy. Samuel, pray for us. Remember last time? They got beat up, and they went, let's go get the ark! They go get the ark, and then they really get beat up. Completely, we're going to leave the battle to God. Yeah. And that's interesting, because when they leave the battle to God, God shows up in amazing ways. You see, they let God win the battle. Now, there's an interesting thing. If you, if you know what an M84 is, I'm not that familiar with it. I'm a chaplain in the military. They don't give me things. I don't get to touch weapons anymore. I don't get to touch really anything. They give me a Bible and say, go out and fight. What? No, that's not what they do. Go out and minister is really, they take care of the truth. But, but really, this is an M84. And I'm going to read to you from here. It's, it's known as a flashbang or a stun grenade. Currently issued as a stun grenade in the U.S. military. Upon detonation, emits an intensely loud bang of 170 to 180 decibels. A blinding flash of more than a, th a million candle uh, with a five, uh, five foot of initiation. Uh, sufficient to cause immediate flash blindedness, deafness, tinnitus, and inner ear disturbance. Exposed personnel experience disorientation, confusion, and loss of coordination and balance. Now these are supposed to be temporary, but there is a risk of permanent injury. And it's classified as a less than lethal weapon. Interesting. 
Because what does God do? He throws a giant M84. He shakes. There's this thunder. And what happens to the Philistines? Everyone around. What happened? What's going on? What's the nation of Israel? Oh, let's go get them. But what you may not think of in this is this is just the Philistines affected. What a miraculous interaction. What a miraculous intervention by God. And, and he throws this giant image. I wonder what God's M84 looks like. Because we're talking about a lot of people and it's directed straight at them. And boom! And they, they run into confusion. If you've ever heard a loud noise, it'll throw you, it'll disorient you for a second. But this is really just wiping them out. It's what is going on? And I have to imagine they're running around in circles. What is going on? Ah, ah! And the nation of Israel, if I was there, if I was one of those Israelites, I'd be like, look at that, that's hilarious. Oh yeah, I gotta look at them. <laughs> because it's, it's amazing when you see God at work, you look and say, oh, look at God, it's hilarious what God's doing. And they say, oh shoot, I gotta go. And, and that's where they go off and they rout them. And it's fascinating to see what happens. This is, they, they, instead of Israel taking up their strength to fight the battle, what they do is they rely upon God's strength. And they submit themselves unto Him. Dare I say, while we would love to impact our culture, while we would love to take up that battle, while we, especially men, we, we men, and, and there are some women who are like this, but it's, it generally is men, we want to solve the problem. We've got a problem, let's solve it. I think I could do this and we could do that and we'll solve this issue. But we got a problem in our nation and we look at that and think, what's the solution? I don't know, maybe we ought to pray. What's, what's, what, is it finally, has it just come to that? That's all we can, well, I guess. No, that's the first step we should take. We've got to pray. When we look at this in terms of what is the nation that turns to pray for us. Continue to pray for you because we need God's grace right now. I think it's the same for us. We need to pray. Because it's God's battle. The responsibility of the people is really to repent and get right with, in a right relationship with God. And then in the midst of that, experience His grace and mercy and deliverance. Isn't that fascinating? Our job is so simple. Pray and watch. Let's see what God's going to do. Even in our own lives, when there are difficult situations, how, difficult, how hard is that to, to stop and pray and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. Well, well, it's easy for us to sit here and say, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, those are stop and I'll pray. But guess what? As soon as the, the screws start turning and you, oh, you get a little uncomfortable, guess what? I got, I got all types of solutions to all types of problems. And we want to solve it. But there are times in life, and, and, and I would venture that most times in lives, our lives, it's time to stop and pray and, and let God deal with it. I think as a nation we're there, and I think in many of our lives we're there more often than we would really like. But as we continue on, let's see what, what God does with this. Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and, and called its name Ebenezer, where he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities of the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. Uh, and there was, also, there was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and then he went in a circuit year by year uh, to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return, return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he would also judge Israel. And he built an alt, there an altar to the Lord. And so what we see happen here is God gives the land back to the Israel. He goes back, and the Philistines are routed, and then they, they, God continues to uh, basically uh, control the Philistines and keep them out, and, and they're beaten, beaten and, the, and Israel gets the land back that the Philistines have taken from them. God continues his protection over the nation of Israel because they submitted to him. God continues to pour his grace and his mercy out. What's interesting is there's a statement, peace with the Amorites, and you may not, may not know who, who those people are. If you go back to Genesis, uh, when, when Noah gets off the ark, and he, uh, a little bit later he's drunk, and, and his son comes in. Uh, these, these are the uh, relatives of, uh, the, you come down through, I think it's Ham, is it? I'm getting that wrong. It's, well, it's the Canaan group that comes out, and the Amorites are part of that. And they, that's the ones that Noah cursed. And, and the other part of this that's fascinating is in Deuteronomy. Israel was told to wipe them out, and they didn't. Why does the author mention this? Why does God so inspire the author to say there was peace with the Amorites? 
Because Israel didn't follow what they were supposed to do in the first place. That means there was probably conflict with the Amorites beforehand, but now there's peace. Interesting. You see, in our lives, oftentimes we want to dabble in sin. We walk away from sin when we first come to Christ, but what do we do? We keep a foot in that camp, and we want to stay there. And God says, no, wipe that out. Get rid of it. Get rid of that sin. We see when Paul speaks of sin and sexual immorality and other sins, what is the word he uses? He says, flee from these things. Run away. I don't know if you ever watched, I mentioned the, the, the Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. If you ever watched Monty Python, Search for the Holy Grail, and you've got a brave Sir Robin, and he comes in, He's brave Sir Robin, and he comes in, and there's a moment where there's this rabbit, and it's killing people, and brave Sir Robin is there, and he's fight the rabbit, and, and, he's, and then he sees what's going on, and he's like, run away, run away, and it's, it's the whole thing, and he's me thinking of this, flee from sin, it's run away, run away, that's really what we ought to do, run from sin, get away from it, yet we dabble in it. The best we can hope for. Is, is really peace. And when Christ comes back, things will be different. This is it. But, but really, we look at this. Why is, why is this? Because we don't root it out. The nation of Israel didn't follow what God had commanded. I wonder what it's going to be like when we get up there and God pours out all of history and we look back at these moments where God says, wipe these people out. I wonder how much of the Middle East issue is because we didn't do that and the yeah. that, that, that didn't happen. It's, it'll be interesting. I don't know what that'll look like. I, maybe I'm off on that. Maybe we've got to say, no, that's fine. But, but really, I look at that and think, I wonder how many things in our own lives when God pours out and looks at our timeline and he says, you remember when you did that here? And he said not to. And you went through all of this turmoil. Look what I had planned for you. It would have been completely different. But you embraced this sin and you wouldn't run from it. You wouldn't flee it. You wouldn't let, it be, let, you wouldn't let me kill it. And so I let you continue in it. Fascinating. For, for, I, I think for us, we have to really look at that and grasp. Are you hoping for peace with your sin? Or are you hoping that God will tear it out of you and, and really be rid of it? I mean, in moments of lucidity, I think most of us acknowledge, I want this gone. I want whatever the temptation is. You know, if, if you're a drunk or a drug addict or, or addicted to pornography or whatever it is, I think in moments of lucidity, we will, we will look at that and say, God, take this away from me. Then we turn and we grab not that far. And we, we strive to hopefully have peace. I, I'll share just a, a quick thing. I, most of you know I'm, I'm a recovering drunk. I haven't drank in quite a few years. But there was a stressful time in the last three months. It was a stress, and I haven't had even temptations really to drink in a long time. And it's extreme stress and, and some family stuff going on and, and down in, in Colorado and in various things. And I'm gone and all this stuff going on. It's stress. And for the first time in several years I had an extreme temptation just to get drunk. Because I knew I could forget for a moment. And I, I stopped and I paused. What the heck is that? Here I thought this was gone. And so I went and bought a bottle of booze and sat and drank. No, I didn't have it. I didn't do that. No, I confessed. I looked at my wife and said, what's going on here? I thought this thing was defeated. And so what I did was I ran away. Run away, run away. Get away from the sin. Prayed to God, God, root this out. I didn't know how deep the roots went. It's fascinating. Here I am, a pastor. Hey, it's almost a, I think it's been over, well over a decade since I drank it. And boom, immediately when stress hits, fallback situations. Interesting how the, the brain, how the chemistry of the body was and all that. And we look at that in terms of what is the result? What is the answer? Well, I could go and do that and fall into temptation and run. And God would, I think then I get there, God will look at what happened when you did that choice. Look at the, all these things fell apart. Look what happened when you did. Hopefully there's somebody here that can value something in that story. I don't know why I shared that. That wasn't even in my notes. It wasn't supposed to be part of it. But really, maybe there's somebody here that needs to hear that. I'll trust God with it. But we look at this in terms of we, we, we abide in and we fall upon and we praise God for his faithfulness and his patience. That's fascinating. Again, I keep using the word fascinating. i, I got to be honest. I am so amazed at God. The closer I get, I just get so amazed and enthused at who he is, and it just it blows me away because God is so patient and faithful to us. Even when we turn our backs on him. God has mercy. When I, when I look at it, I say, there is absolutely, it has to be supernatural because there ain't no way I'd have mercy on somebody. But God does. And then I have to remember, he pours that out on me. I think he uses most of his mercy on me most days. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a little bit left for you guys. <laughs> 
No, but we really, we, we pray out. And, but, but really, the, the notion that I see happen and, and, and is abundantly, uh, I think, lived out in, in Western culture and in the Western church is this notion, well, we're going to rely on God's grace and mercy, and then we go on and we continue on in these sinful lives. And Paul warns us against this in Romans 6. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? Death, we were buried, therefore, with him uh, by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, in the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. You see, the, the reality of it is, is God's faithfulness and, and, and patience is not something trite that we should trifle with. The reality of it is he pours it out and he calls us to live a new life in Christ. So when I submit, I'm going to put that before you today. If you've walked away from Christ, why? Make today the day you choose. I'm going to get back and write. Said if you if you've never committed your life to Christ, why? What is it you're putting your hope in? Choose today to submit yourself unto Him. And finally, it closes with Samuel doing his circuit. He's got a preaching circuit. If you've ever been out in, in the Lincoln County, I, I have to think that there they, would be interesting to be a pastor that would be on a preaching circuit and go through various small towns. But Samuel's going to do this yearly. He's going to go on his preaching circuit. Why? Because we need constant reminders. Interesting how God has set up our life groups. We were going to have two on Tuesday nights. One in Davenport and one out here. But, but really, God completely shuffled everything. We have one Sunday, one Wednesday, one Friday. Isn't that inter that's interesting to me because I look at it and say, why? Because we need constant reminders. Really, if you're not in your Bible, we need a constant reminder of who God is and who we are and how to submit ourselves unto Him and to live for Him. And Jesus states in, in John 14 when He speaks of the Holy Spirit, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the help of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. We need constant reminders of who God is in our this is why I would look at this and I'd say Sunday morning is so vital and important that you come to church and you hear God speak. And I'll be honest with you, if you come here and you're like, I don't hear God speaking through that guy. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but the reality is I know there's churches down the street that God's speaking through those pastors. And, and there is kind of a fit thing that we have to look at, but, but really I would look at it and say, get to church and hear God speak. And then jump into a life group and hear God speak. And then open your Bibles and hear God speak. Because the reality of it is, is you need constant reminders because you're a saint living in a fallen world. Most of our day is inundated by things that would crave, that would desire for that would call us away to crave after the flesh. Most of our days are that way. I can't hardly watch football anymore because they got all this, so many inappropriate commercials. I ah, to change the channel. He goes, on the other channel, golf. Golf is terrible. <laughs> can't watch golf. I'm watching golf for. That's the other channel. I watch golf or football. And I turn the TV off, open my Bible. And that's what I should be doing. But really, we need these constant reminders in our lives. And, and, and I, I look at that in terms of, if, if you're here today, uh, there's no mistake that God brought you here for whatever reason He brought you here. But really, I, I would offer to you, make a choice. Choose today. You know, it, it's too easy for us to complain about the various things in, in our culture, too easy for us to complain about the various things in our lives. But, but really, it comes down to, are you going to live for Christ or not? Are you going to submit yourself to a holy God or not. It's not a decision I can make for you. It's not a decision the person in the pew next to you can make for you. It's not a decision your parents can make. It's not a decision your, your wife or your husband can make. It's a decision you've got to make. But you do have to choose. And, and, and there are many people who would say, ah, I'll, I'll make that choice later. I understand you're making your choice then. Choosing to abstain means you're choosing not to follow. And that's really, I, I don't want to harp on that. That's between you and God. And that's him calling right now. <laughs> he wants to talk to you. <laughs> You're in trouble. There's a poem. It says, There is a time we know not when, a point we know not where, that marks the destiny of men for glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. Today's the day for some. And I'm not going to have you raise your hand. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to do an altar call. I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor if this is you. 
I'm going to have you look to the person that you know that loves Christ. I'm not going to have you come talk to me afterwards. If you're, if you're new here, go, come to the, the coffee and donuts with me. I'll talk to you about who Christ is. i got no problem with that, man. Hey, we got elders and others that say, love to, this is what we love to do. I'm going to tell you, make a choice. With that, let's pray. And gracious Father, Lord, what a gift it is you've given us to be here. To follow after you and, and, and Lord, that you would pay such a high price for us. I am amazed, God, that you would pay a price for me and, and the depravity of who I am. Lord, that you would pour your grace out because you so value a relationship with, with me, even me. I believe I have perhaps a competition with Paul in being the chief amongst the sinners. But I think most of us with an honest look would look at our lives and realize that truth in our own, our own lives. But Lord, you are amazing. I pray for our nation. Father, as I do look at uh, us being in a time of, of, of a position where we do, as a nation, need to choose. But Lord, if this nation chooses not to follow you, I pray for your mercy to be poured out upon your church. To be poured up, out upon those believers who would not just sit in the pews, but actively seek their relationship with you. And that, that mercy would draw others into a right relationship with you. And Father, as we turn our attention now to communion, and I, and I consider the message you had prepared this week for the day that we do communion. Ah, oh, what a high price you paid for us. Father, we thank you for this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.